Are all fMRI results wrong? That was the question raised last summer in a paper by Eklund and colleagues in the prestigious journal, The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS for short. The question was whether cluster correction, a commonly used method in neural imaging, is responsible for inflated false positive rates, or saying that a result exists when it actually isn't there. Similar to what happens when you think that your cell phone buzzed, but actually, you're just going insane. There have been issues with neuroimaging methods before, such as circular or bias analyses, as well as erroneous interpretations of interactions and other statistics. However, this problem is much more widespread because the vast majority, nearly three-fourths of studies, use cluster extent thresholding, while the remainder either use voxel-based thresholding or do not use any correction whatsoever. The idea behind smoothness and cluster correction is pretty simple, and why it's so popular. If you were to take a painting and to smear your hand across some paint across different boundaries, you'd be mixing spatial information across different areas. We do the same thing when we increase the size of our spatial smoothing kernel, from say 4 millimeters to 8 millimeters to 16 millimeters. It gets blurrier and blurrier. So at the cost of spatial sensitivity, we can increase our sensitivity to actual activation by summing across activation that's actually there and canceling out noise. Now smoothness is estimated from the residuals because we want to know how often we would see a cluster of a certain size just based on random chance from noise alone. For example, if you give 3D full with half max an AFME program, your error time series, everything left over after you've estimated a model, you get estimates of the smoothness parameters in the X, Y, and Z directions. These can then be fed into 3D plus sim to form cluster thresholds. For example, the average of all those three directions and giving it a cluster defining threshold of 0.01. In other words, every voxel that's contiguous has to pass an individual threshold of 0.01. And how often would I expect to see that cluster? Well, a cluster in this case of 667.8 would be found 5% or less of the time. So I could go ahead and say, if I find a cluster that's greater than that size, that's so rare or so unlikely that I can go ahead and determine that the cluster is in fact significant. Looking at my results, I then compare that cluster size to all my clusters for a given contrast and determine which ones are significant and which ones are not. There are two main assumptions with cluster thresholding that are flawed, however. One is that spatial smoothness is constant over the entire brain, and second, that spatial autocorrelation is normally distributed. First, spatial smoothness actually varies over the brain. It's not constant, and it's much higher in areas like the rostral, anterior cingulate cortex, the retrosplenial cortex, and the precuneus, wherever the hell that is. The point is these areas have intrinsically higher smoothness than other areas and will show higher false positive rates. Second, the correlation between a voxel and its neighbors does not follow a normal distribution or Gaussian shape, as shown in green right here. In fact, it follows a mixed distribution between a Gaussian and an exponential distribution shown in red, and that seems to model much more accurately the actual correlation between a voxel and its neighbors shown by the black line. Updated versions of 3D Clausum can now account for this mixed model shape. These flawed assumptions led to the false positive rates reported in the Eklund paper. You can see in the far left across all the different software packages, SPM, FSL, and AFNI, and across all kinds of different experimental contexts, you find inflated false positive rates relative to the expected false positive rate of 5% reflected by the black line. Notably, across all the different scenarios, permutation testing, which does not rely on parametric assumptions of the normality of the distribution, did equally well. There are three ways we can address these inflated false positive rates. One is to use voxel-wise Bonferroni correction or false discovery rate. Now, the problem with these is they can lead to inflated type 2 error rates where you don't think there's a result when, in reality, there is. This is analogous to you don't think that your cell phone rang when, in fact, you were being called by two hot chicks that like to party and just want to hang out tonight. Another approach is to use a more strict cluster-defining threshold of P equals 0.001 with updated versions of 3D Clausem to more accurately model the spatial autocorrelation function. The steps for this are shown in the text box down below. Or, thirdly, you can use non-parametric methods such as FSL's randomize, SPM's SNPM, or Anders Eklund's own broccoli. That sounds delicious. And that's all there is to it. So remember to use a stricter cluster defining threshold, update your version of 3D Clause Sim, and you should be good. S sorry. 
Hello? Hello? I could have sworn I heard something. 